Hello everyone. 20 years ago, Latin American cinema exploded around the world. From Mexico, the names of Alejandro González Iñárritu, Guillermo del Toro, Alfonso Cuarón, rapidly became a referent for everyone around the world. And not just from Mexico. From Brazil, there was Walter Sales, Fernando Mireles, Padilla. From Argentina, Trapero, Lucrecia Martel. Many names from Latin America that were suddenly setting the bar really high. There was no cool festival if it didn't have a Latin American film. Names like Wild Tales, Roma, Fantastic Woman, titles like Embrace of the Serpent, No, The Milk Sorrow. Latin American films have been celebrated around the globe, and especially at the Academy Awards. But we're not stopping there. Many filmmakers are crossing over and expanding their careers into the English language industry. And those stories need to be heard. In the following panel, the amazing producer Rosa Bosch will have a passionate debate with four filmmakers that are already shooting in English that have so much to say and experiences to share. So please stay for the panel, enjoy the panel, and remember, tell your own stories. Thank you very much, Diego Luna, for such a heartfelt introduction. And thank you very much for joining us and kickstarting this uh, academy conversation from Latin America into the mainstream. Today, my, my name is Rosa Bosk, and we are being joined by four leading filmmakers uh, from Latin America, Gerardo Naranjo from Mexico, Jairo Bustamante from Guatemala, Marcela Said from uh, Chile, and Cari Menus from London. This is truly a global event, although these are leading Latin American filmmakers. This conversation is conducted uh, in Paris, London, Madrid, and Mexico. So welcome to all of you. Thank you very much for joining us for uh, giving us some of your time in the middle of busy schedules. Uh, COVID has had an effect in our cinema lives, but has not managed, and it looks like, will not manage to stop production. I would like to begin with to introduce you a little bit to the people watching from all over the world. So if you allow me, I will go around each of you, and uh, it would be very uh, good to hear what you're working on now. So uh, Karim Enouz, Brazilian born, Algerian uh, descent, uh, based in Berlin, truly man of global mystery. You are now based in London. Uh, your filmography is extensive, documentaries, fiction. Uh, Karim, tell us a bit, uh, what are you doing in London? What's going on? I'm doing, I'm actually prepping a feature film called Firebrand, which is the story of the last wife of Henry VIII. I think we know a lot of the wives that perished under Henry VIII, and this is the story of the wife who survived him. So um, it's a portrait of Catherine Parr, that was her name, and um, we're planning to shoot at the beginning of next year. And it's very exciting to be able to get my hands on this character and, and, and draft a portrait of these women that have normally been portrayed because they have perished, and it's so good to be able to to tell the story of one who has survived. So that's what I'm currently working on. It's my first English language film, really. Um, and I'm very, very excited to, to do this. Well, well, we'll catch up on that much more. Marcela Said, Chilean born, again, extremely, I understand Chilean born, but again, we are, the four of you represent such a diversity in Latin American culture is an extraordinary, Pleasure to have you. You are Chilean born, but with some Palestinian ascent, I believe. Um, probably as comfortable in the French culture as you are in the Chilean uh, one. Uh, recently, we've had the pleasure of seeing you direct a couple of episodes of Lupin with great panache. But you also come from the documentary background into fiction, mainstream television. Uh, tell us what, what's next for you? What is keeping you busy today? Uh, well, I'm currently, I just finished writing with uh, Gonzalo Massa, uh, our next, my next feature uh, that is uh, going to be in English. It's uh, called The Hand for the Puma. 
And I'm here in London directing uh, two episodes of uh, Gangs of London, which is also television for Sky and is in English. So my first time directing really the whole episode in English because Narcos was uh, bilingual. Gerardo, Mexico City, uh, but you are also not only known from the beginning of the I guess, Mexican uh, gang that came out of the Critics Week of Cannes with your drama Mex. Miss Bala, of course, is a milestone in Latin American cinema. Not only did you do the Mexican version, but you also did the American remake. I'm sure- I did ex- I did Not the remake, sorry. <laughs> so you didn't direct the remake, but you produced. Yeah, I produced. Ah. Sorry. Which is an even more interesting experience. Perhaps we'll talk about that. Um, what, what are you working on these days? Tell us what you're uh, at. Well, uh, first of all, thank you. Uh, you know, honor to be among these filmmakers. You know, uh, Madame Chata, uh, Karim is, you know, when I saw that, you know, it was important for me, you know. Uh, so, I'm working in a Netflix uh, documentary. It's my first time doing documentary. It's, uh, it's about a case where a French woman was accused still in Mexico about uh, being a kidnapper. So, you know, it's been 15 years uh, from that event that happened here in Mexico. It triggered an international crisis, political crisis. Uh, it's called the Cassez Affair. Uh, so I'm finishing that. It's a five, it's a four four episodes series, and wow. Well, what to say? You know, I I, I feel yes. Um, going to documentary is very humbling. I feel it's a lesson I will um, I will uh, advise for any filmmaker just to surrender yourself against destiny and um, what am I uh, I'm working now in a movie uh, it's a it's a it's a love story it's English and Spanish uh, it's about uh, it's a tragic love story and it's what I hope to be shooting in uh, 2022 where uh, oh my god it's uh, I guess we're gonna we We need a lot of money, but it's all over. It's New York, it's Mexico, it's the ocean of Oaxaca, um, the, uh, the Mexican University, it's all over. It's a contemporary love story, and it's a very tragic one where, you know, the, the girl in the story, which is a Mexican girl, uh, dies. This comes from a real story. The author of the novel that is inspiring the film Uh, his name is Francisco Goldman. Um, you know, he's an author, a great, uh, you know, author. And he's writing the script. And it's about, you know, this very unfortunate event. Uh, so, you know, very lucky to be. Uh, Looking to be. forward to seeing Jairo Bustamante from Guatemala. I, I think you are a unique piece in Latin American cinema because truly in my lifetime, I have not seen anyone that with your Volcano trilogy, sorry, I think some of us call it Volcano trilogy, Temblores, Ixtanul, and of course, the huge success of La, La Llorona, you've single-handedly put Central America in the map and with an indigenous component that is really so intrinsically and beautifully waved in. Uh, I think since the days of, uh, since the 50s or 60s of political filmmaking, there hasn't been someone like you with such a, a reach. So what are you doing in Paris? What are you working on? Tell us what's next. Hello, I'm in Paris in a, in a kind of um, holidays and developing because I'm just finished my last film um, one month ago. And I'm editing the film myself with my producer. And it was a very nice story because The, the shooting, I mean, the shooting was a nice story uh, because it's relevant for, for my country and I think for the world. I'm talking about the childness and how the adult, we take care about them. And, but for the film, that time, it's one when I shoot in Guatemala, I start preparing the actors to, be, to become an actor because we have a, a very small industry in my country. So at that time, I, 
I arrived to, to finish the composition of, the, of my school, actor school, and, and I formed 250 girls in Guatemala to become actresses. Uh, after I made a, a casting for five, 6,000 girls who came to participate in the film. So it was a very nice experience and, and in six months we could form that actresses in a so well way that I was surprised having them working with me. And it's girls coming from eight or 17 years. And, and really I think right now we can say that we have real actresses in, in my country. When I say actresses, I mean movie, uh, cinema actresses. And, and right now I'll, I'm developing a, a saga of films that the platforms prefer to call it a series, but it's talking about the, the Mayan cosmology. And for Mayan people, there is not anybody ordinary. Each one is extraordinary. And I'm talking about all the gifts that Maya think that we have, just because we have a Nahual as a protector uh, living with us. It's a full of magical realism. Right. I hope you have a good holiday as well, well deserved. Of course, for those of us listening, you probably realize as well, if you followed uh, Marcela's career, that Marcela's uh, both feature films, uh, Los Perros and Los, Los, pa Los Peces, both deal also with indigenous uh, local communities, Marcela. So not forgetting your own contribution to that. So anyone listening to the four of you, I think has very clear idea from what you said, why we're calling uh, this discussion today from Latin America into the mainstream. You have all worked through the festival, traditional uh, ways uh, of presenting films into a much more global and ambition reach. Now, one of the things that I'm very curious, and I'll let you jump in, whoever wants to speak first, is th there is a perception that perhaps the arrival of the platforms, the globality, uh, the globality of what the Netflix, Apple's, Amazon's, the uh, online viewing and streaming has provided filmmakers from non-English speaking countries with a much wider outreach, not only for the films you've made, but in the case of you, you are all very comfortable directing in French, in English, in your own uh, Spanish, in indigenous, is, is this true? How do you feel of the pla have the platforms, the arriving of the platforms really given a global outreach to your work? Marcela, you want to start with that? Uh, yeah, okay. I mean, um, it's very weird, I would say, because, um, you know, like, if you ask me, I didn't want to be a filmmaker. <laughs> like, I mean, I come from, yeah, I wanted to do politics. <laughs> And I, I start doing what I do because I have this necessity to talk about what, what was going on in Chile, so in dictatorship. So, so and I spent like 10 years doing documentary films and it took me a lot of years and it was very passionate. And then like, I feel I had to jump into fiction. My, the Summer of Flying Fish was a story I couldn't make, I, I couldn't make a documentary about that story. So I had to write. So I started writing and, and I discovered I love that. And, and then, of course, uh, I guess I had the chance, like the film really was taken into Cannes, and then it was Los Perros, where my real first feature completely. I mean, I, I was writing alone, so I, I wrote Los Perros alone, and, and it was a very, very good experience. And, and then it was, you know, I, I used to live in France. I live in France for a long time. I still, I still do. I live in Paris. But I was always focused on directing in Chile. So when the first time they kind of invite me to direct in, Fra in French in Paris, it was uh, Lupin. And I was so happy, you know? And it was because uh, after Narcos, I told the production, you know, I live in Paris, I speak French. I can do it in French. And this is my, my, my real second language. It's not English, it's French. So, and, and I was so excited. Because um, I know the French culture is also my culture. I consider myself Chilean and French. So for me, it was a, it's a massive experience. And 
when it was quite um, funny, it's like a lot of people didn't know me because I took art house films. And after Lupin, I had all these people, ah, so you had other films. Ah, you come from documentary. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's not, <laughs> yes. I mean, this is a Lupin is work, Narcos is work, but what I consider my real work is what I write. When, you know, my next film that I'm writing with uh, Gonzalo Massa that I'm going to shoot in Chile. And, and of course, I'm going to direct in English and also for, uh, for as you say, because I want to make it global and bigger. And because my character are, are, is an English couple, actually, who's traveling to Patagonia uh, to visit the French couple. And this comes from a kind of real story. Um, so uh, I guess it's very normal. We, we live in a world that is uh, globalized. We, we travel a lot. We, 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 all of us, we, we speak different languages. I mean, Karen, he lives in Berlin, he told me. I mean, so he must speak German and he comes from also Algerian background. And, and, and I don't know, he's in Paris, but I know he can speak French. I mean, um, so we, we are globalized people and, and we, are, we don't want to be also considerate, all, all, you know, like where, because I'm Chilean, I just have to direct in Spanish, a, a Spanish and just about my subject. I think all the stories are universal and, and, and we realize, I mean, the good thing about Netflix, about Amazon, about Apple, about all this platform, is like uh, it's the same that happened to us when we came to Paris for the first time. You know, I start watching Latin American cinema for the first time in Paris. When I was living in Chile, there was no distribution, so I didn't know Mexican cinema. I didn't know Argentinian cinema. I didn't know that what what my my people were doing and I discovered Latin American cinema in Paris, in the festivals. So I discovered we, we were so much alike that we come from the same kind of landscape stories uh, with the same difficulties, well, I mean, difficult things. I mean, we are small countries with a very small production. It's very difficult for us uh, to, to produce sometimes just a, a movie and then at some point, and we had this, you know, this big cinema from Hollywood. And I remember what some like looking at those films and say, well, I we would never do that. I mean, we just come from, you know, um, and do you know what, what changed my perception about fiction? I must say, it was when I, I saw in Paris La Cienaga, uh, the film of Lucrecia Martel that I really love. And I I I saw the film and I saw. This is, this is my story. These are my, my landscape. This is my people. This is a beautiful piece of art. And this is something I can do. And we all can do. I mean, like it, it feels very close and achievable. And so like, yeah, we can do that. Maybe at, at that point we couldn't, you know, we were not into explosion. We were not into Blade Runner films in Chile. I mean, doing this kind of things, it was, like what we call mainstream, you know, uh, it was. It felt very, very far away from us. Uh, like something. There's a lot of things that we don't know how to do. I mean, or we didn't know how to do. Even me. I come from documentary. When you, uh, Gerardo, told me I'm doing my kind of first time documentary, like. But I come from there, so that's my school. I come from this school. When you, it's a very good school. You, you adapt. You find solutions immediately. I come from you. What anything can happen. So I'm not afraid. Now, if I'm in a, in a, in a big, you know, and I'm like we're working in Gangs of London and with a big budget and there's a lot of people, but also there's a lot of problems, but I'm not afraid. I mean, I come from Latin America, everything can happen. <laughs> so I just, it's a very, it's, it's, there's, there's no stress for me. So uh, that's a very good school. Actually, we have something, we Latin American directors, have something that maybe is a, is a very good thing. We come from this part of the world where everything can be very difficult and we have a lot of problems and everything is like, we can do a lot of things with nothing. So when we have things, we can do much more, of course. So maybe the real thinking when we started with this was that conversations like this can help, if I can pick up on one of your words, to. Uh, 
let people know that there is more than one mainstream. There is only not one kind of mainstream, which is the Hollywood mainstream, but we can achieve mainstream and the platforms and globalizations can help us to do that. So let's look at different mainstreams. Karim, what do you think of the brave new world of platforms, globalization, access? I think it's just a really interesting, I feel really privileged because I remember when I started, it was really like, I started making films when there was no digital, you know? So everything was, it was, it was really hard and it's complicated. And I think I feel really privileged to be gone to have gone through this period where it became digital, so then there was a possibility of doing things which were perhaps more agile when then you're working with with um, with film, and then the platforms came on in a moment where um, distribution has always been a really huge problem for Latin American cinema. I think we have a very rich tradition and very diverse and very vibrant, but as Marcela said, you know, the way that things were position to the public was always very complicated. Like for me too, I remember seeing much more um, Latin American films when I was traveling with the festivals when I started to make films than before. So I think what the platforms have provided, which is really exciting, is the possibility of different formats in the sense of like, you know, episodic storytelling or, you know, the, the classic sort of format of a fiction film. But also I think what's been happening in the last years and it's really important to talk about this in Brazil now, for example, you know, I mean, Latin America is very, um, it's full of emotions. One year you have one government, the other you don't. And then so sometimes you have public funding, sometimes you don't. So it's a very sort of, you know, um, dynamic landscape. And I think one of the things that the platforms have allowed us to do is to keep working, like thinking of what's happening in Brazil now, it's, you know, with, with this horrible government that's um, there, which has decided to erase any possibility of cultural diversity and expression. The platforms has allowed us to keep us working, but it also has allowed us to keep us working in a very inventive way. So I think it's really a wonderful time thinking of what we've been through in Latin America and thinking now that there is different possibilities of working, different possibilities of telling stories, different possibilities of talking about our own um, culture. And I think English language is still a very strong, you know, films in English language and series are a very strong market, obviously, because of the Hollywood system and the star system. But I think there is also a new generation which is making work locally and broadcasting it globally through the platforms that I think it's really empowering. And that's what I think it's really um, fantastic about the times we're living in. And I think we need to be, of course, attentive that we're not, you know, we're not working with the, for the platforms, but with the platforms and, you know, making sure that we still have our own voice and our own ways of telling stories, you know, that we're not sort of, you know, doing things which are very homogenic. But I think it's a really interesting moment to, um, you know, you know to, to just work with, work with, the with the many possibilities that we have now that are much bigger and much larger than we always had, we, we've ever had in history. Uh, and I think also way of telling stories. I think it's very, it's very exciting, for example, that we have here um, Gerardo, who's been working with documentaries, only been working with fiction, who's working for a platform, you know, and uh, Marcela, who's been working with documentary, and now is working with fiction, you know. So I think it's allowing us to, to, to travel between genres and between um, formats, which I think it's really always exciting and always inspiring. So. I don't know, I just feel very fortunate to be living in a moment in history where there is so many possibilities um, to tell stories and to, and, to, and to also tell stories which are very local. I think this is what's really fascinating about the times you're living in is that, you know, look at Haidu's films. I mean, there's nothing more local and beautiful and poetic than what he's done. And I think um, the platforms are allowing, but not only the platforms, but I think there's an ecosystem that's allowing for his films to exist and to be seen, you know, around the world. So linking on that, in fact, Jairo, before we also hear what you think, I mean, it was an extraordinary thing to see you building up uh, through your Volcano trilogy and culminating with La Llorona, going into one of the most astonishing Oscar nomination campaigns I've seen in, in recent memory, and even very moving to see you getting the attention of the likes of Jane Fonda, supporting you. 
you must have had a really interesting experience in terms of going straight into the Oscars campaign, the Jane Fonda, that attention. Tell us a little bit how you see uh, this global situation helping the very, very strong and focal identity you're putting out. Yeah, I agree with Marcela and Karim about the fact that platforms are important for us and, and about the, the, that moment, that period, so, so unique in, in our history. But I don't want to forget the people who start before us and the people who start opening the doors. And there is a lot of actors, actresses and filmmakers who went to that Hollywood market or Hollywood place, mainstream, and they start open the mind of, of USA people saying that we are a lot and Latin America has a very good market. And, and for, for a huge time, a long time, they didn't keep the opportunity to say there is a, a market, there is a continent speaking the same language or understanding between them, even because in Spanish and Portuguese, Brazilian, I mean, it's, it's very easy to understand. And so I think that people start open that. And right now platforms are taking advance of, of that. And for sure we have to take advance for that. And, but there's still a lot, of, a lot of problems in some regions in, in Latin America. For example, in Guatemala, people doesn't have access to, to movie theaters, but either, either for platforms there is less than 9% of the people having access to the platforms. And because there is not internet, because, it's because the 80% of the population live in a extreme poverty. And, but it, that, no, that doesn't mean that they don't wanna consume films because for example, with Ishkanul, my first film, we made a kind of a normal distribution in Guatemala. And after that, we had a, an alternative distribution, taking a, a kind of a van and a, a screen with us and a very, very small song equipment. And we moved to the communities and we made uh, 80, 000, uh, 80 000, uh, tickets with the communities. And it was very important for Guatemala. It was the first time I made more than in France. And, and in France, people, I have a good market here, a good audience here. And so that's a very important thing that we have to continue pushing uh, our energy in, in because it's, it's a kind of a responsibility to, if, if we cannot arrive to that people that we, I think in my case, that people need me more than French people, so, so I don't want you to forget them and I continue for sure making a, a, a TV film or a platform film, I don't know what, what we have to call it. Um, it's important because it's a kind of a show of card, but use that show of card to come back and make another uh, film, social work film, <laughs> Uh, continue being very important in my case. Very interesting. And the point you raise, feel free, of course, as we started and as we've heard from Diego, the number of people, the number of filmmakers that have preceded you is not just filmmakers, filmmakers are the captains of the ship. But of course, we all know that we've had the wonderful array of Latin American DOPs, you know, from Chivo Lubezki to Navarro, to music supervisors, Lynn Feinstein, to writers, Gonzalo Mas. I mean, the talent behind all of you as directors is extraordinary. So let me just take this one moment to say that, as they say, behind every great director, there is a great team. And in the case of Latin America, the talent of actors, uh, director cinematographers is uh, outstanding. We could do a series of events on just cinematographers, set designers, mm -hmm. and even a few producers. Um, so Gerardo, you are in the eye of the storm, Mexico, the border with the US mainstream, of course, Miss Bala being a milestone film which you then went on to be executive producer on the remake. 
Um, that was quite an experience. You really went into the belly of Hollywood with it. Tell us a little bit yeah. about what you think. And then of course, Narcos and everything else, but a little bit of your experience would be interesting. Well, um, it's, it's awesome to just hear the, uh, my other fellow filmmakers and just uh, agree on how hard it is to begin over there in Latin America. So yes, when you cross, I feel, you know, um, my experience in Latin America, I feel it was very physical making the movies, you know, you have to carry or even if you have to, even if you have to just convince people, I feel it's something much more physical. I think, uh, you know, crossing the border, it's much more political, you know, it's, it's about the word, it's about communication, it's about, um, yeah, I feel it's um, something much more in, in manners, you know, in, uh, in how you drive yourself, how you show your character. Uh, so I guess we have those both sides, you know, Latin American directors or filmmakers, uh, you are right. Uh, Rosa, when you say that we, we are surrounded by this incredible talent that makes, uh, you know, we're just the top of the iceberg, but yes, there is a lot of work and a lot of wisdom that you get from the process of uh, um, every collaboration. So yes, I guess uh, it's something we, you need to put your seed and, you know, put the water and eventually that relationship will give certain wisdom to the project, I feel that's the, well, that's uh, how I see it. Um, about but, Hollywood, but, let me tell you that. Uh, well, you know, um, I, I'm very interested in, in producing, um, you know, um, yeah, getting to know how the industry works. So yeah, that's why I joined in Miss Bala, the remake, and it was very interesting, I guess, the decisions uh, how the decisions were made were to me the most, uh, you know, interesting uh, event. And I will mostly be a witness to tell you the truth, but uh, it was a very interesting uh, diving into the American psyche uh, for my part. It occurs to me hearing you all of you that perhaps whilst 10 years ago, anyone would have said that in order to be a global filmmaker, shooting in different places, in different languages, you sort of had to go into the Hollywood system, be showered by Hollywood agents and have that kind of machinery, the agent, the manager, the this. And by listening to all of you, it seems to me that that is no longer a necessity. There is a different way of developing truly international careers of filmmakers without going into that. I mean, for instance, Jairo, did during the, the La Llorona camp Oscar campaign, did you have lots of Hollywood agents approach you? Yeah, I had my agents at that moment and my manager. And I remember that when, when they approached me, I was making a canoe and I told them, I have a trilogy to make, so please just wait a little bit. And after that, when I finished, like when I was starting La Llorona, they came again. And I asked to Karim, do you remember Karim? I asked to Karim, really, I need them or not? <laughs> and, and Karim tell me, just sign, don't worry, make them work. <laughs> and, and it was like that. And, and I'm very happy because the people are very, are really, a, hard workers and they really take care about the idea that I, I bring to the table and they don't they don't they don't are just looking for push me in the mainstream market they are helping me to to defend the the thematics that I want to work and and they are help me to to make in to grow up the, the my local industry in Guatemala and, and jumping a little bit about that um, Gerardo was saying and Marcela was saying about the fact that we can do anything and in Latin America and about the, the so talented teams that we had. I want to add that we have very, very generous team in Latin America. And I could leave that because all the people that I called to come to Guatemala and work with me, with me they came and they informed my people, my local people, uh, and that was an, an, an unexpected um, 
give because right now we can build a film with Guatemalan people. So that I think as a, as a Latin American, we really felt a, a kind of um, unity and, and I'm very happy for that too. So Marcela, what do you feel? Is it needed to have a big Hollywood entourage to further your international career? Because it seems like it's not the case. Uh, all depends what you want, I guess. You know, it's um, for me. You, I, I I I I told you the truth. Like for me, it's it's very important not to to lose uh, the north, as we say in Chile. Like to know exactly at least what you want and to have your heart very. You know, um, so I know that I, I cannot get lost. I don't want to get lost if you if you ask me. And I know I need to tell my own stories. Um, that's why for me, I've been writing for three years, almost like The Hand for the Puma with Gonzalo. And it's very, very important for me just to go and make this film next year. So I start the process of, of the casting process already. So I'm, I send the, the, the script to the actors. Um, and I know this is priority. And my agent and the people that what they are they are, I told them and they know this is priority. So, uh, which is very difficult. It's like now for me, maybe also being a woman, like I'm, I'm getting a lot of very kind of exciting propositions. Um, and I have to say, well, I love them. I mean, it, it looks really exciting, but I really want, I need to make my film. I need it. Uh, and I did it for, for different reason, because this is what I am. This is what I really want to, to tell. This is the, my cinema. And for me, it's a, it would be very nice if you can combine both, meaning I can do my own stuff, writing. And in the meantime, while I'm writing, because it's a very long process, I can maybe direct for someone else if I really like the script, or I can go into a very exciting project. Uh, because what I like about working, for example, now in Gangs of London in, in, in UK is like I meet different people, I meet different crew, I, I learned a lot of different things I have, I have never done. So I have the opportunity for me, it's like being at that school. I mean, like they don't know they are paying me to learn. Like I'm in school, I'm learning and I'm doing. So, uh, so I, I see all this like a huge opportunity actually. And, and they are happy because I can bring them something new, something fresh, but also I'm happy because they are giving me a lot of things to work. So it's a win-win. Uh, so uh, when you ask me about my agent, uh, yeah, I mean, it's interesting. I mean, to have an agent and to have, especially because you have someone to discuss because you can be very, uh, being a director is a very lonely thing. Like people imagine a director being shooting, you know, with a lot of people, but this is just like 30 days of, 30 days of shooting maybe, but you spend like uh, three years writing or you spend so much time doing other kind of stuff. So it's a very lonely process. Um, so, uh, it's, it, and, and sometimes you, you, you have doubts, you need someone for the industry. I mean, they can really be, in, they can be with company. So you need someone to, uh, to tell you, you know, Marcella, are you sure you want to do this? Or maybe this is a very good opportunity. Take the call. This is nice people. So um, I would say is a, to, to each director, if that's what you want, if you really want to go to Hollywood and you really want to maybe go for uh, these kind of films, well, go for it. That maybe you need an agent and you need to go into these kind of projects. Uh, but if you are dreaming about other kind of thing, just don't go. I mean, you don't need that. So all depends what you want. I mean, you have to be very honest with yourself mm. also. And any filmmakers listening to this, I'm sure that they're making notes as to what you're all saying. But Karim, you are a wonderful example because of course you're about to start a film proposed to you by the indomitable uh, Gabi Tana. So it, with the Hollywood A actress, not one, a few, but an elite one, Michelle Williams. So where do you stand on the Hollywood agent's uh, dance of, uh, what do you think? Yeah, listen, I didn't need it. It's, it's an interesting question. I did start many years ago, I can't forget, um, 
about 20 years ago. And I did have an agent at the time who was a great agent, but I don't think I was really ready to go there just because I felt I just needed to improve my calligraphy in the sense of like what I was doing, you know, it was my first film. And then it took me a few years and now I'm, I just feel really lucky for a few reasons. I feel very lucky to have great agents who are around me and sharing not only the projects, but what, you know, why are you making this and, and how do you want it to be made, you know, and how do you want it to be seen and so on. So I feel very fortunate for that. And I also feel very fortunate that they are sort of you know, introducing me and starting relationships. Like for example, the one I have with Gabi Tana now, which was, you know, who was introduced to me by an agent, by my English agent, Sophie Dolan. So I think it's just, um, it depends as Marcella said um, on what you want to do. But I do think as I was talking about platforms before that I feel that we live in a time that we have access to different possibilities. And I think it's really great to think about that as a privilege, because I think a few years ago, that wasn't the case. And I think I feel very fortunate that I can do a movie here in the UK. And I think it's also great. You know, I think it's a tradition of foreign directors making films about, you know, English stories. And I think it's really great to be able to be part of that sort of legacy. But at the same time, I feel that I can and I will be making films in Brazil again. So I think it's um, it's really great to be able to have choices. And I think that's what's really wonderful about um, the position I'm in now. And, and the world that we live in. So I think the agents can be, and they are great to help you, as Marcella said, as sounding boards and also people that help you sort of navigate that world. And then also they're very, um, they're just, you know, there's something really beautiful about that relationship that I never had before, but also they're great in the sense of connecting with producers that you are gonna have long time relationships um, so it, you know, it's sort of a matching game, which I think it's always really, um, really exciting. And I also feel like it's not anymore about making a choices of making a film here or there. I think you can make films in different parts of the world and you can always go back and make films in originally where you come from. For example, I don't think I'll ever stop making films in Brazil, in Portuguese. And I think it's great to be able to, to have the option. So I think, um, it's just a really interesting moment where also, I mean, and I think this has always happened, but I think it's happening more and more. I think Marcella said something really exciting, which is about, you know, uh -huh. we are the kings and queens of improvisation. I think in Latin America, you never know what's going to happen tomorrow, you know? So I think we need to improvise all the time. And I think that gives you a muscle and a certain, you know, sense of poetry that you have to exercise every day. And I think, I think for the, you know, for the mainstream, it's really important to have us as well. You know, I think that we are bringing a new breath. We're bringing new electricity. We're bringing a new way of looking at things. And so I think this is also really important for us to, to acknowledge and for everybody to acknowledge. You know, I think it's really, it's really fun to bring some chaos into the order. And I think it's really fun to learn some order, you know, to sort of, you know, deal a bit better with chaos. And I think this is really, I don't know, I just find it really exciting to be able to have choices. You know, when I was beginning to make films and I actually, like Marcel, I never really planned to be a filmmaker, it sort of happened. I did a documentary, then I did a short film and then I needed to do the portrait of Madame Satan, which was my first film. So I think thinking back, I mean, I think we're very isolated. And I think what's really wonderful about what's happening at the moment is that we somehow can have more choices. And I think the other thing that I think it's really important to talk about it here, for me, making films has always been a political act, you know, like making films and choosing the characters that we're going to portray and choosing the way that we're telling stories has always been about change, has always been about inclusion, has always been about, you know, um, it's never been only about entertainment. And I think this is what also has been really great um, in this dialogue that it is, you know, I think, we never made a film in Latin America that we just wanted to make it. We needed to make it, you know? And I think this energy is something that I think it's really something that will never be taken from us, you know? And this is, um, this is profound. And if I may pick up, of course, there's something we haven't talked about this. There is a history of cinema behind all of you. Uh, I, I was dying to ask a bit earlier to Gerardo. I'm sure that in, Ms., in the case of Ms. Bala, he had the long shadow of Iñari to Cuaron and El Toro follow him around in a good way, but also sometimes in a confused way. But you know, none of you, and it would be quite good, referring to from Bertolucci doing The Last Emperor, 
to angli sense and sensibility to the third man there is a long history of cinema where the nationality or the passport of the director or the language was not so important perhaps the only thing that i would add and i let you pick up is that it would take 10 years between those films or 20 years the diversity yeah. that we now have in term of women genre and diversity culturally is much more frequent than the isolated case of the last emperor or uh, angli sense and sensibility uh, any one of those people that you really look up to and think i pick up some well i mean um, tips about this what i would like to say is um not at all, because I feel when you have a real process, when you are with some comrades, you know, that you are going to do this, uh, this, um, how you say, this um, mischief, you are going to go and rob the bank and you have your friends and you are making the plan. I feel something starts, you know, you start dreaming and I feel um, very early on you start, you stop you know, uh, you stop dreaming on the earth. I feel you start having real ambitions and and I feel that's when the movie happens. So, yeah, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm very proud of the cinematic tradition that Mexico can give or, you know, I, I bet every country has where Jairo is making his own history in Guatemala, but I feel many other countries also had, you know, like, Mexico was highly influenced by the Russians and Einstein came to do, you know, Que Viva Mexico. And he had the cameraman, uh, Eduard Tisse, uh, and he said that Tisse gave to Mexico all the technique, like the technique we use is Russian because of that. And I feel it's, um, I feel when we were, you know, working in, and we, you can be ambitious well, yes, I guess um, you get to dream with the other people how to, you know, uh, you know, use the medium or whatever you are doing in the with the with full intelligence, with full life. Uh, I guess also what we are doing, and if you let me be a little poetic, is to celebrate life, even if we are complaining and we are being political and we are showing horrible stuff of our realities. I feel in a weird way celebrating, you know? Anyone else would like to speak about some of the people before you, some of the people led the way? Jairo, who do you look up to? I was thinking about a very funny thing, if we can tell that funny about the, because in Guatemala we, we have a lot of Mexican influence with that Russian influence. And after that, we had a lot of Cuban influence with their Russian influence. And I was just thinking that Guatemalan people will continue saying that artists are communist. So it's, it's a funny thing. But, but for sure, for sure we had that, that two nations giving out a lot of, of classes to make cinema. And, and right now, my, my last film, I, I shoot it in co-production with, with USA. And it's the same time that we had to change our system, work system. And, and at the beginning, I was a little bit confused because we had that um, Latin American system with my French side. And when the Americans came, Americans, U USA people came to, to me and we started working with them, I discovered that they follow process who works very well and process who, who help creativity. So I start saying, but I don't understand why they, they, they work so well. And, and we start keeping a lot of their processes to, to implement that in our way to work. So and we start saying at the beginning, globalization is not only to tell stories, Globalization is always is to, to understand how the other works and implement a kind of a global system to, to help us take the best of each one. 
Marcela, where are you on this? Oh, you know, you, you, well, you name all the directors and, and I was thinking about writers. Like if we have a, a huge tradition in Latin America, it's writers. I didn't know maybe Mexican cinema when I was young, but I knew Juan Rulfo and we all read Mar Garcia Marquez and Cortázar, Neruda. I mean, I mean, we came from writers, we tell stories. So uh, for me, the, the Latin American literature was very, very important. And if you ask me if as, a, as a filmmaker, of course, we have Ruiz, which is huge, and Patricio Guzman, the documentary, Carmen Castillo, of course. And, and then, well, Mexican filmmakers that are younger, like, uh, I'm not that younger, but Iñárritu, Cuarón. And, uh, but when you ask me who uh, influenced me, uh, do you know my favorite uh, cinema is Russian? <laughs> it's, uh, it's like uh, Andres Vagisnev, again, I mean, he's, he's one of my favorite filmmakers, and, uh, and Tarkovsky. Uh, I like Bergman, I like another kind of cinema, and, and and I remember when I was 17 at the university and I had this friend who used to bring his cinema project, a projector and, and we saw Alice in, this, in the cities, uh, uh, being vendors. I mean, he used to show all these kind of films also. And Polanski, like Kuto Dan Lo, the knife done in the, one of the first films of, of uh, Polanski and so- Knife in the water. Exactly, exactly. I remember that experience and I remember those films. So um, those were very, very important for me. But I was not trying to copy someone that's very, uh, or uh, you learn just, I mean, I guess the best school you have is just watching all this film, all these stories, but all these stories come from, from literature. I mean, it's, it's like, it's a, it's a writing process, no? When you write with the camera. So uh, for me, uh, one of the, the more exciting moment is not only the shooting, but it's the editing. Because it's a, you, you write the film three times, no? you write, which is a kind of guide, the structure, I would say, but then, then you make the film one, and because we come from Latin America, I feel very free. I, I, I guess, well, I don't know the way Wes Anderson work, but I imagine he's very control freak and everything is like very, very measured. And I'm exactly the opposite. <laughs> like I'm very free and open and I like to, to tell the actor that they can feel free or we can improvise, or we can change things. I like surprises. And, and then I like to, in the edit, still to rewrite. This is for me what is exciting to have this possibility of write, rewrite and, and to build the film little by little. I know Pablo Larraín does the same. Like uh, he shoots a lot and then he, in the edits, he really makes the film. So. That's, I mean, we are very different, all of us, I guess. And, and, and that's what is very nice about cinema and about authors. It's like, we're all different and we discover ourselves in a culture, uh, and, but in, in the middle of the world doing all this in, in, in very different process. And I was very curious when Jairo was talking about the things that he learned working with American, in the American system a little bit with the American producer. Like I'm now, I'm very curious. I want to know. You have to tell me. <laughs> Karim, what, where, where are you on this? What, what, what has influenced you? How do you see who came before you? Uh, it's so important. I mean, in my case, it's a little messy. You know, like I think I was influenced by some. No, I was really influenced, but I think some queer filmmakers like Fassbinder, who was really like a big influence on me but so different though German you know and I just think why do I like this this work so much but there was there was an anger there that I really liked you know and I think also there was a lot of Brazilian cinema from the 1960s that was really important to me there was a sense of rebellion you know of like breaking the rules you know when you think of how films were made and with the you know I think when new technology was 16 millimeter but I mean I was very influenced by a lot of those guys from you know the 60s and I also was very influenced by soap operas you know I mean I was growing up in Brazil in like in a soup of soap operas so there was something about them that I've always refused but at the same time I've always felt you know I, there was something that they did to my heart that I think it was really incredible so I think it was it, it's a and, and also music I think I was very influenced by you know I remember that um 
every film I make, I mean, I, it begins with the song and it sort of literally ends, you know, it begins with the song in the sense that it's sort of, you know, it's what inspires me. And, and it's, there's always a major song, you know, that I need to have at the very end, at least. So I think these were, um, I think I was, I was very fortunate to be growing up, you know, be growing up in a moment where there was all these different influences. You know, of course I was influenced by American cinema and especially again, I think the question of music is really important. You know, I can never forget the moment I saw Saturday Night Fever and the moment I saw Fame, for example. You know, these are two films that for me were really, um, were really fundamental. You know, the sense of joy that you have when you are in a movie theater. So this, is, this I think, I know it sounds like a crazy mix, but I think I've always, I've also sort of accepted to, to take on this mix and, and make it mine in a certain way. So I think, um, and I'm also very excited now. I think we are in a moment in the world, you know, when you think that Mankiewicz did Cleopatra and, and when I think that, you know, now we'll be able to tell the stories of those people here up north, you know, that have always been telling our stories. I think it's also a really exciting moment and this sense of um, turning the game, you know, and, 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 and bringing this sense of, you know, of anger, rebellion, poetry, sort of viscerality that I think we have it's not only Latin American cinema, it's in Latin American life, you know? I think it is really, really, it's a really exciting moment for that reason. So I'm, I'm inspired by, you know, all of this, but also by this possibility of telling the stories of other nations and other countries, which are not ours and how we can, you know, how we can access that place because it's been done the other way around for so long. So it's really exciting. Um, to do that as well. But I think to, to finish this, I think what's really been inspiring in terms of, um, of other work, yes, a lot of Russian cinema, a lot of documentary work, a lot of work that I feel it is about a certain freshness, you know, and I don't know exactly, I love when I don't understand really well how films were made, but they somehow touch me profoundly. So I think these are the filmmakers that um, without citing too many names that really have turned me on. Before we close so many things, we haven't talked about film schools. Uh, we haven't talked about many things, but we, I feel we could do a documentary series of like at least six or seven episodes with uh, all that you have to say. I think what is very moving of what comes out of what you've said is, is a remarkable conversation to say where, certainly not one I've had before, where the fluidity of genres, documentary, fiction, television, you are comfortable yeah. and well versed in so many of these. This is really news, even for the Iñárritu, Cuarón, uh, Del Toro, uh, Mereyes, they did not have this glorious moment that you have of an opportunity of moving across, of building yeah. milestones such as Guatemala from zero, where, you know, not only Jairo, I should point out, is a filmmaker, but he's also building a whole community in a production house. and. And, and bringing all sorts of other uh, filmmakers in is a unique moment, but because we're looking to the future and my God, you have the, given an amazing credit to music and literature, which undoubtedly you could say, the boom of Latin American cinema without the boom of Latin American literature might have not been the same, but I want to leave you with a gift. We're gonna play Aladdin, um, Aladdin with a lamp, and I'm gonna grant you a wish. Because I think perhaps we've been a little bit serious and all of you have a wonderful sense of humor. So now is the moment where you can let your head down and I'm gonna let you all have a wish for cinema. Obviously, we have managed to have this hour conversation without talking about the death of theatrical cinema. None of you have raised it, which I think is fantastic because as we know, I think for the last 30 or 40 years, we've been hearing the cinema is dead cinema doesn't die, it evolves in different ways. So one wish for your own cinema, uh, filmmaking or for the good of cinema. Jairo, I'll let you start. One wish, you are being granted anything you want. Oh, for not money. Not money. <laughs> no, for sure. I have enough. <laughs> no, for, for my own cinema, uh, I mean, having the, the freedom to, to be a production, productor too. I love it. And I love, and I love discover other talents. And right now we, I'm finished a, a film that I produced in Argentina. 
and I, and I want to be my producer. It's very strange for film directors, filmmakers, because normally we don't love that, but I really enjoy both. So that's for mine. And for the global one, I, I will say for the Latin American one, a large distribution between my own countries. And I think we, we can do uh, very strong things if we start watching our films with less problems. Marcela, what do you wish for? Oh, I guess I, I really wish it's something more general. I think with, you know, with the pandemic and the COVID and, and cinema has suffered a lot. And, and in Paris that we have this lot of, a lot of uh, Salle de Cinema and they have suffered a lot. So I, I really, I wish all the people can come back again to a, to take advantage uh, because I, I belong to this city who loves cinema and and we have this great tradition and we in, in France you have a, a large distribution of cinema of, from all over the world and and I remember if I was very proud about living in Paris is about this you, you go for this small book called uh, you know L'Officiel and you have like 200 different films it's like that almost weekly so, and, and I could just choose and go to the cinema every day if I wanted. I mean, I remember that, that, that those were my years at the university and, and I enjoy that so much. Um, so I wish that, I wish like the new generation, like the new people that now they are coming back to the university, all these foreign people coming to my city could do the same that I, that I could do when I was younger that uh, I want them to be able to just jump into those cinemas. I used to jump into, to watch films, uh, sometimes even like uh, that I couldn't understand and I really enjoy them. So that, that's a huge experience. That's what I really want. And the I'm return so of Cinematech, the return of Cinematech culture. Yeah. We need a digital Cinematech perhaps. Yeah, but- Gerardo, I mean, what do you wish for? We're asking the impossible, so yes, uh, definitely. I, I will. I will put it in a different light. I will say, you know, yes. I, I wish people will dare to, you know, to turn off the cell phone and get into a dark room where. I feel when you let those, you know, how to say that to the new generation, uh, when you let yourself be, you know, completely smashed by a film in the dark room. I feel it's a. Uh, experience that um, transforms you, you know, when you see a Bergman film and you don't move and you don't check the messages, uh, you get out being a different person. So yes, I would say that, uh, dare to do it. <laughs> Marcela, I'm sorry, did I leave you halfway through? You had the second part of your wish? Yeah, but don't worry. <laughs> oh, sorry. Maybe I can, I can live without that wish, but uh, no, of course, <laughs> for my own cinema, I won't be able to, uh, to do my own cinema, to keep on doing what I like, you know, to tell my stories. Of course, we all we all want that, and that's what I wish to all my colleagues, that we we can still be able to have our own voice. And Karim, what do you wish for? I wish that there is always a space for us to take risks, to experiment, to go a bit crazy, to not know exactly what we're doing. You know that there is space in the industry to diversity really, you know, that we can keep inventing, reinventing cinema. I think it's such a young form of expression that I think the moment that I see things being a bit sort of square and, you know, domesticated, it feels really boring. So I just hope that in the next few years, we don't get more homogeneous, but we get more um, diverse. I wish for, um, you know, the cinema of cinema and, you know, that could be a large word from places like Africa and you know, our Southeast Asia, you know, some places that we don't know much about, you know, here in the West that they can, you know, they can have structures that they can be making more films. I think it's really important that we, it's so interesting what happened in the Academy a couple years ago with Parasite. I mean, I think it's so important to have, you know, languages which are not necessarily, I mean, English is a very important language, but there are really a lot of languages out there that us as spoken as English. So I think I just wish for more diversity in this industry. I think we learn so much when we see stories that are told in a different manner than ours and from places that we don't know. So I think we need to be more diverse. That's what I wish for. And also, you know, and again, for more risk. 
Well, I think we've come to the end of the time. Um, to thank you deeply, um, it's been an inspiring conversation. Uh, hopefully, the one of many to come. Uh, thank you for your time, for your insight. Um, as the heading of the event says, um, you are from Latin America into the mainstream. You are truly global in every aspect. All that remains for me to say is looking forward to seeing what you're cooking up next. Uh, hopefully some of those will be as you've been before on the international Oscars. Um, again, thanks to Diego Luna for giving us also his time for the introduction. Uh, we'll see you at the movies. Good luck with all your projects. And uh, lastly, thank you to the Spanish Academy in Madrid for uh, giving us some hospitality to do this event. Thank you very much, uh, Marcela, Gerardo, Jairo, and Karim. Hasta la vista. Ciao, abrazos. Thank you.